My name is Ken Sagendorf. I'm the director of the Innovation Center here in the Anderson College of Business at Regis University. Hey. Oh. Good. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited. I want to see who's going to win all this startup money. Are you guys excited? All right. The goal's always been to fill the room, so good job. Hey, we're going to give away over $17,000 in cash and prizes tonight, plus uh, Innovation Center office space over the summer, and you're going to help us. So a couple things. You should take out your device. I know you have one. You can use your data. That's cool. Do use it. Or you can log on to the Wi-Fi. Okay, there's a Regis Net Access Wi-Fi. Log on to that Wi-Fi. You're gonna need it because we're gonna tell how you're gonna help us pick the winners tonight. Okay, before the excitement builds too much, let's take care of some housekeeping that we're gonna need later. I need to say some thank yous. First of all, I need to thank Event Services. I need to thank ITS for all their help. I need to thank Dave Law for bringing us the stage here that we're working on. I also need to thank some of our folks in the Anderson College of Business, uh, Deb and Sharon and Jasmine and the other Sharon and Rayanne and Tom Mallory and Dean Keene. Who else? Oh, all right, this is good. Okay, we'll, 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 start, we'll stop there. Um, uh, I need to thank Katie. Our student photographer, thank you, Katie. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, uh, let me explain a little bit about what this whole thing is. Um, Regis University, the mission is to help create men and women in service of others. And in the Anderson College of Business, our vision to help businesses become stewards of society so that they might uh, improve the quality of life on Earth. And that's a big deal that vision is for us. And, and you're going to see that vision come through in this competition tonight. Um, we want our students and our alumni and our business friends to build businesses that are anchors of their community, that solve real problems and make the world better. Keep that in the back of your mind, that solve the world's problems and make it better. Uh, let me explain how this competition is unique. This competition, the Regis Innovation Challenge, is a publicly open competition. That means that you can compete if you're a student at Regis. That means that you can compete if you're a faculty member at Regis, a staff member at Regis. Doesn't matter what college you're in at Regis. But we're also open to any public business that wants to compete with an idea in our competition. Tonight, you're going to see two of those community businesses compete. The, the thing is, every team has to have at least one current Regis student on their team. And why do we do that? Because those businesses might hire our students. They get great experience from being on those teams. Um, and some of the students that are on some of the teams, the two community teams that are going to pitch tonight, they've got some awesome experiences. So you should introduce yourself and ask them about those things. Um, I want to welcome some special guests. Uh, Adam Barajas, I saw him. And the Arupe Jesuit Innovation Club. Awesome. Can you guys stand up for a minute? All right, if you know anything about entrepreneurship, it's about an ecosystem. It's about being able to um, start early and keep going. So we're partnering with Rupe Jesuit High School um, to start the Innovation Club with the hopes that next year they're on this stage with us. Yeah. <laughs> Good. And we're going to make a, an important announcement later um, to tell you about what we do after the Regis Innovation Challenge. So uh, welcome, Rupe Jesuit Innovation Club. Glad to have you here. I want to introduce our judges. You'll see them scroll through here. Um, I hope we left you enough time to read all that text. But uh, judges, if you would just stand up when I introduce you real quick. Uh, Will Alston, Regis alum, president and CEO of the Denver Urban League. I squished him in there good, too, so it's hard for them to stand up. 
Alisa Esposito, Senior Channel uh, Manager, Channel Marketing for Rico USA, a good partner of ours. Peter Lynch, the founder of Hit Studios. John Vasquez, CEO and Chairman of Zavaro Holdings. And Jamie Gronowski, CEO of Gronowski Advisory Services. Important to know that Jamie is also a, a Regis University Board of Trustees member. And most importantly, he is the angel of the Innovation Center. And without him, none of this that you're all here for tonight exists. So thank you, Jamie. Cool, so I get to talk first, but I'm actually not the import most important person here, just in my own mind. Good, we just wanna make sure you're laughing where you're supposed to. Another uniqueness of our competition is that we're a student-run competition. What does that mean? It means we're all learning at the same time. Two students are my go-tos uh, for the last eight months, Bailey Gent and Zach Pearson. <laughs> These two are my awesomeness. Um, I, ha I have to admit, uh, just here amongst friends, that I am heavily type A person and wound a little tight. Um, so it's been really hard um, to give up checking on every single detail because it's just not really who I am. But with Bailey and Zach, I did. I gave up some control. And so far, it's the best challenge we've ever had. Friends, I give you Bailey and Zach. Ken doesn't give himself enough credit. If we didn't have him, we wouldn't have our jobs and we wouldn't do what we do. So he is very important regardless of what he says. Um, so we've been working hard since the fall to put this together for everyone. And we're excited for you guys to be here because it's been a long process to get here, but very exciting. Um, as Ken mentioned, one thing that's special about our program is it's the only student-run student program of this nature in the state of Colorado. So we have a lot of opportunity to be really engaged with all of the teams, um, really a big part of the program. So in October of last year, we had over 50 people um, show up to our launch event to come see what our program was gonna be about, how to participate, what this process was gonna look like. And then in December, we had the finals event and ended up having several teams come and pitch incredible business ideas. From there, we ended up with the top nine that we have here today that you'll see pitches from. And another thing that makes our program unique from others is that ours is a really learning intensive program. So you'll see a lot of pitch competitions that a team comes in, they pitch, they're able to win money, but ours has an element more to that that really allows all of the teams to leave with something, whether they win a cash prize or not. So all of the teams go through a three-month mentoring program, and the three-month mentoring program equips them with a mentor, workshops in different business skills, and then the opportunity to really have designated time to work on their businesses, which is important for busy students. Um, so it's really been amazing to see all of these teams create and cultivate their ideas during those sessions, and they've all come really, really far, and I'm so excited for you guys to see everything that they've done. And then we'd also like to take a minute to thank all of the mentors who made those mentor weekends possible. So our mentors, and then also we have um, Dennis and Marty, who were a big part of our Mentor Saturdays as well, and did strategy consulting and really helped all of the teams get a good handle on what they were doing with their businesses. So mentors and Dennis and Marty, let's give you a round of applause and a thank you. Excellent, and then we're so excited to get started and get the pitches going. So Zach will give you a couple more logistics on how to vote, because your vote is a very important part of the process, and then we'll get started. Okay, so keep your phones handy. You guys will need them for the voting. But um, I would like, as we recognize our mentors this evening, um, we have to say that the Regis Innovation Challenge is equivalent to it takes a village. One of our gracious partners um, and Brainspire, Brainspire and DJ, DJ and Brainspire have been working to build a custom voting platform for the audience to vote on which team wins this evening. So to get onto the voting app, go to tankevent.com on your smartphone. 
if you don't have data, log into the Wi-Fi or log into the Wi-Fi anyways. Um, choose the Innovation Center logo. You can click on it once you get into the Tank event, and that's it, you're in. Next, I want you guys to register. Register with your name and email address so teams can con contact you at the end of the day if they, if they wish. Now, for the voting, pretend you guys have $1 million, and that $1 million, you guys get to decide who gets it this evening out of all, all of the teams. Now, you guys can change it throughout the night. We will tell you once a million dollar vote is locked in. And by the way, you guys cannot vote for more than 100%. You can only allocate 100%. Um, and then, as Ken mentioned about the, the challenge, if you look in the first page of your pamphlet, you will see the desirability, feasibility, and all of the judging criteria that goes on to how we judge. Also, you guys, are, you guys as um, audience play a very important role this evening. You guys account for 20% of the vote, and our guest judges account for the uh, remaining 80% of the vote. I also ask that you guys stay until the end where we mention all the four winners who will win the prizes. Ken? Yeah, thanks, Zach. Uh, where's DJ Wardinsky? DJ, thank you very much for the voting software. Um, he's the man that has given us the ability to vote. And, and he's the reason why you can't add up to more than 100%. Okay, thank you, DJ. Um, makes a world of difference, so cool. I wanna share with you last year that the audience vote skyrocketed somebody near the top. So you play a big role in this. So please vote and know that you can vote repeatedly. You can keep moving your stuff, okay? So, and it's a little weird if you vote for somebody you hadn't seen yet, but hey, that's you, go for it. Um, I need to recognize our sponsors for everything that we've done tonight. And, and again, I wanna point out a little uniqueness of our competition. So we aren't a, a business college that has gone out and sought at, at first big corporate sponsorship. What we've done instead is we created that thing out there in the parking lot, that alumni matrix, drawing our alumni back in. And I'm proud to say that every single one of our prizes in the Innovation Challenge has been donated by an alumni. So uh, a couple folks are in the room, and I'd love to have you stand and just, and just honor you. Um, the grand prize tonight is, is sponsored by alum Rick Parker in the RH United Foundation. Uh, he's giving the $10,000 gift. And then another alum, Phil Worthman. He was here. Phil Worthman <laughs> is giving the, the grand prize winner a year's worth of Sandler Sales Consulting from Phil's own business. So thank you, Phil, very much for that. Um, Our friend Tommy Gahuli with Higher Learning Partners here at Regis has donated one of the prizes. Um, Kenton Lee, I saw him come in. Kenton Lee, who was our speaker outside, um, he's gonna pick a winner tonight uh, for his cash prize as well as access to his Pursuit Incubator in Idaho. So thanks, Kenton. And then Dennis Cater, uh, president of the Colorado chapter for the Association for Strategic Planning, has gotten the association to donate one of the prizes as well. So thank you, Dennis. <laughs> thank you for supporting all of these entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a true model of companionship, um, and, we, and we appreciate it very, very much. So uh, we couldn't do any of this without you. Bailey, what do we need? I have one thing. Let's do it. Okay, my one thing to add is that I am graduating, and so this position will be open um, next year. So for students who would be interested, um, this director position will be open. You'll get to be a part of this process. I can tell you it's been super fun. It's a really cool way to watch all of the teams learn and grow, and it's fun to work with Ken. It's fun to work in the business school. It's, it's a good thing. So if you're interested, let us know. Um, and then we'll also be hiring social media and a photographer position as well. So we have some new roles opening, and which is fun, and then this role. So if you're interested, let us know. Nope. Anything else? Nope. Yeah? Okay. All right. 
Enough announcements, right? That's, we're not what you came to see. So let's get this show going. Here's the rules. Five minutes. The teams have five minutes to pitch. What does five minutes mean? Not 5.01. Five minutes. Okay. Um, you want to see how mean I can be? I'm going to let Bailey be mean. Okay. <laughs> five minutes. Hard stop because we got a lot of teams tonight. Judges, you have five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to swap the teams out. Uh, in between, the more loud you get, the more T-shirts we're throwing out. All right. All right, ready? Okay, you want to introduce the first team? My home fix. Here we go. Thank you. you got it. Thank you. You got it. Okay. Think about your last home repair experience. Did it look something like this? Or this? Or any of these? Why are home repair projects so frustrating? They're frustrating because millions of homeowners, like myself, lack the knowledge of time, money, confidence, or skills to complete their own home repair project. I'm Trista Sandoval. This is Matthew Sweeney, James Knoll, and we are My Home Fix. My Home Fix is an augmented reality and educational app that brings home repair back into the hands of homeowners. How do we plan on doing this? Let's take a look at our app. Users are able to download our app via the Google Play or Apple Store. Once inside the app, users are able to, once inside the app, users are able to select the home repair project that best suits them. Here we're going to see how to fix a leaky faucet. Before you get started, you'll be able to see the difficulty level, average time, cost, and all the tools to complete your home repair project. Augmented reality is the opportunity to see your virtual world in your environment. In our tutorials, homeowners are able to do their own home repair projects because they're able to see it in their live environment. Once the tutorial is complete, users are able to rate our app for improved feedback and share their success stories on social media. The power of home repair is now in your hands. In 2018, 89 million US households were planning home repairs. Of that 89 million, 47 million were do-it-yourself projects. Audience, with the raise of hands, how many of you have ever planned a home repair? 40% of you will not even try or complete those projects due to lack of financial constraint, <laughs> knowledge, or lack of other resources. As you can see, the total market for home improvement in the US is extremely large, with big box retailers accounting for more than half of this 371 billion figure. Strong housing markets and aging homeowners are spending an average of 1500 annually on nine home repair projects in the household. This is the space we intend to play in. So our app has four tiers for pricing. The first is our free. And free is intended to catalyze adoption and leverage affiliate marketing. The second is our apprentice model. This is a pay-per-use model. This will help us to better understand the value of augmented reality with our customer base. The third is for the everyday Bob Vila out there. And the fourth is our contractor B2B model. This is a model that puts all of their knowledge in one single convenient space. So here's our long-term growth strategy. Right now, we're in the development stage. But with your investment, we can accelerate into the testing stage. This is our origin. We are a business that is up here today in front of you that has followed the path laid out by Regis University. It started in Ken Sagendorf's entrepreneurial innovation class right here on Regis University in the Innovation Center. From there, we took the idea into the Innovation Challenge. And since then, we've incorporated, we incorporated our business in February of 2019. We used our own resources to pay a coder to build the proof of concept that you saw up here earlier. And we launched our social media and website uh, platforms. To date, we have over 87 followers on our platforms, 
and over $1,700 raised. With the $10,000 money, we intend to build three more tutorials, continue developing our app, and acquire more customers, especially in business and industry. So here's the next 90 days for us. We're gonna build content because we know content is king. And we're not gonna wait around while we fundraise for our app. We're gonna do everything that we can. And this is the dream team. Here's who's gonna do it. To start us off, Trista Stanoval is our market expert. James is our finance guy. And I'm product. Frank Trevino is our IT expert, and he's got experience in augmented reality, artificial intelligence, mobile app development, and global startups. Lisa Best consults Fortune 500 companies in marketing, global supply chain, and corporate communications. So in sum, we're a company that values simplicity, community, and stewardship. Investing in us is investing in that path. We are my home fix. We are augmented reality. We know you can. Can you click another oh. slide, please? Yeah. And another mic. Thanks. Uh, well done. I think that was exciting to see how far you've gotten since the last time we've talked. Um, take a breath. You're done. <laughs> uh, my first question, or maybe we only get one question, um, help me understand why you picked this segment of the market. You had lots of opportunities. What's your personal tie to this? So I have some experience in the home repair and construction. And we actually wanted to start in art, uh, advanced manufacturing, because that's where I work in right now. And that's where I've seen this disruptive technology go. But we dug into the data. And what we found is that home repair and construction is a place that's largely untouched by this technology. So that's why we wanted to position ourselves. Uh, two part question. One, how many uh, tutorials do you have in the system now? And two is most everybody that's got home projects would just Google and go see a video. What are you going to do to keep people from, or you've got a better mousetrap. Why are they going to go to you? So we have one tutorial right now, and that was our proof of concept that we built that you saw up there. Um, and the reason we're different, or why you wouldn't go to YouTube to find that video, or will be the next revolution of that, is because in our app, you don't have to pause, you don't have to rewind, and you can actually see that repair tutorial in your own home, in your own environment. And augmented reality will also allow you to see it from every angle. You can zoom right in, you can date part the model, you can see through the model, you can do all of this stuff that a poorly shot YouTube video won't allow you to do. Uh, could you name a competitor or two, and what would be a differentiator for you over them? Um, so iFixit is doing similar educational tutorials, but they do not use augmented reality, and they stay in the computer appliance repair business. Um, other ones are um, Stream, which uses augmented reality to basically circumvent the initial site visit in a home contracting experience. So they'll use augmented reality or a user's camera to be able to identify a problem, and a contractor can remote in through that to do the initial assessment without getting on site. So we plan to go for the full tutorial with that. So my question is going to be, when you were showing the faucet, and there's so many different brands, yes. how are you going to be able to show a tutorial for each of the brands? That's a great question. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Not that the other ones weren't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can take that. Go ahead, yeah. That's a great question, as Matt said. Uh, we've actually thought about that, and we're still honestly exploring how that's going to look. We have tossed around a couple different ideas, but really we are in the infant stages right now, and so we're really trying to make sure that the technology works, that our tutorials work, that the user experience is solid, and then we're going to start tackling that. I, I think additionally to add on to that, um, the, the vision that we see as a company is in sense some type of business alliance with the manufacturers. 
Um, A, the value prop to them is greater exposure. And the benefit to us is possibly uh, kind of curveballing around the intellectual property rights. Um, and additionally, we might eventually down the road see that as a direct avenue into big box. What is the cost per tutorial and is it scalable? So if you're going to have 100,000 of these, 50,000, 10,000, how much capital are you going to need? Okay, so um, from what we've seen in the market and from doing some research and also talking to the original uh, coder we have hired, um, for smaller home repair tutorials, we're looking on average of anywhere from five to 750, larger projects obviously scaled out. Um, the greatest thing that we have found out, it, it is possibly duplicatable. And what we also intend to explore further is crowdsourcing for content development. Right. In the first meeting that we had, and maybe it's an unfair question, but um, you had talked about an opportunity to show where you could purchase it, a directional piece to this, and maybe some ease of use to the consumer, where to buy it, could they buy it online? Just some of the connectivity. Are you waiting for that in a subsequent launch to the app, or what's your, what's your process for that now? Yeah, so uh, Home Depot's affiliate marketing program will allow you to kind of uh, start marketing their services in there. The e-commerce platform that you saw up there that we didn't get a chance to dive into deep allows us to take that, those products or the SKUs and into that, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> apparently, Zach's the mean one. <laughs> All right, Invictus Project, we're getting your stuff ready. Judges, fill out your sheets. We're going to let you keep all your sheets till the very end. All right, folks, if you're coming in, we have some seats still up in the bleachers. Come on in. In stream water, you're next after Invictus. Come on down and get ready. Who wants a t-shirt? Oh. <laughs> Just so we're clear, there's nine teams. <laughs> <laughs> Go on 15. Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Can you guys do me a favor? Real quick, raise your hand if you or someone you love has been negatively affected by a mental health disorder. Now keep those hands raised and look around the room for a second. Mental health affects every single one of us. You know, Sam and I both had our hands up as well. He and I both served as bomb technicians in the Army with multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. And like most vets, we suffered with mental health issues and traumatic brain injury when we got out. Like most vets, we sought treatment through the VA. I was handed pill bottles and exposure therapy. These pills actually led to worsening symptoms and side effects. Imagine for a second taking 12 different prescriptions and seeing no relief. I had finally reached my breaking point, and in April 2015, I put a 45 in my mouth, ready to find my relief. My four-year-old son saved my life that night. All I could hear from the hallway was, Daddy, are you okay? So what's the problem? Well, did you know that the average disabled veteran's on nine to 12 prescription pills a day? Or that we account for 20% of our country's suicides? Colorado in particular, Colorado in particular has over 400,000 vets and we're the ninth leading state in suicides. Sam and I were almost a part of these statistics. And we didn't quite know why we were given extra time until Memorial Day weekend, 2015. While everybody's enjoying barbecues, 
A mentor of ours walked out into his backyard and shot himself, leaving his three-year-old son in the house. What we need is a new approach to treating mental health disorders, a diagnostics first approach. Any patient that's treated by us first receives a Q-spec brain scan, as you can see behind me, from our partner SareScan, as well as a comprehensive blood lab. What these diagnostics do for us is they allow us to see a comprehensive look inside the patient's body and their mind and confirm diagnosis. To give you an example of how powerful these tools are, our first patient, John, was a bomb technician, just like us, who had been to Afghanistan and suffered traumatic blasts. He was diagnosed with it by the VA with PTSD and had been on six different medications for about five years. After a while, John finally reached his breaking point. He decided to end his life by pointing his gun at a cop, attempting to commit suicide by cop. Luckily, he's still here with us. We knew we had to do something, so we flew him out to Colorado and we scanned his brain. Turns out, John didn't have PTSD. He had three distinct traumatic brain injuries that were causing all of his symptoms. John cried when he saw the results of his brain scan. He looked at us and said, thank you. I finally know I'm not crazy. There's something wrong with me. We put John through two of our pillars of care, and our current patient has gone through all four. This is because we tailor our treatment protocols to exactly what's going on with each patient's brain. As of right now, we are in our data collection phase. We are putting 20 combat veterans through our treatment protocols and being treated through our partners with brain scans and blood labs on either side. Once we gather this data, we're going to create an outpatient clinic that brings all of our partners into one shared space and streamlines the patient's process. But our ultimate vision is to create this, an integrated practice unit that not only serves mental health, but has a gym, yoga, healthy eating facility, and other holistic mental health treatments. This is a snapshot of our pro forma that details our growth over the next couple of years. And since the innovation challenge started, we've been incredibly busy. We've raised just over $24,000, treated two patients, and gotten second in the Angel Capital Summit pitch competition. If we win the prize tonight, that $10,000 will go towards saving our next veteran's life. Sounds great, right? Well, let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room. Sam and I aren't doctors. We are combat veterans, and we know exactly what our brothers and sisters are going through, because we've experienced it firsthand. We've researched this problem extensively. We've sought out medical experts in their field to form strategic partnerships, as well as our own team. But we know we can't do this alone. We need your help. Together, we can change the way mental health is treated in this country. Together, we can bring a husband, a wife, back to their spouse. Or like me, a father, back to his kids. Thank you. And for the purpose of the Q&A, we have some slides up here that you can reference. <laughs> you guys talked about uh, not being doctors. That's a challenge that in an industry like this that you're going to have to kind of overcome. Talk to me a little bit about how you guys want to dig in and, and, and achieve that. So we actually have an interesting business model because we're bringing our partners under one roof and taking a holistic approach so that our medical directors from our partners will actually look at the brain scans and the blood labs and take a collective effort on what the custom treatment is. We are creating an integrated practice unit where we will own the space. We have partnership agreements in place where they will be tenants of ours and we'll take a portion, small portion, from each patient. Uh, imagine us as the we work for treating mental health. Guys, thanks for your service first. Uh, secondly, do you see, uh, see this private sector, public sector? How do you kind of align yourself to how you make money, how you get paid? So right now, if you look at the, uh, the mountain we're climbing here, in the data collection phase, we have a nonprofit, and that's what's funding this initial data collection is donor dollars. However, we also have a for-profit side. We have another business, the, so it's the Invictus Project and the Invictus Institute. What this hybrid model allows us to do is take on capital on the, uh, the for-profit side and continue to treat veterans and first responders on the nonprofit side simultaneously. And ultimately what we're trying to do is leverage that data and share it with the VA so the VA becomes a provider and becomes a partner with us because currently they can't handle the patient load. And ultimately we're trying to partner with the DOD to retain the warfighter. 
Uh, also, just thank you for your service. Um, maybe a comment, then a question. Uh, have both of you gone through this, I guess, the question first. Have both of you gone through this treatment? I, I haven't gone through hyperbaric yet. You see that brain scan? That's actually mine. Uh, the blue there is traumatic brain injury, and the darker the blue, the less blood flow or oxygen. So I'm going through hyperbaric in about two weeks. And yes, I have received all of these treatments except for hormone replacement. So I w went through ketamine infusion therapy, uh, did hyperbaric, as well as some traditional counseling life coaching. That's great. Um, just a comment. Very impactful points. These are real life issues. They're, they're serious and they need to be addressed. But there are some very positive natures of what you're talking about. And from a nature of investment, we, we want to address the positives. We want to see where this is going to be helpful. So just a comment, there's lots going on inside your medical process and thesis. It would be great to be able to see, and I know this is a short five minute, uh, quick up and down, um, that it just be nice to see before and after maybe brain scan, some quick hits for us to understand because there's so much that's going on here. It's tough to understand. We, uh, we were actually planning on providing a lead behind that actually shows all the peer-reviewed re peer research. All of these have been well-studied individually. They're all shown to be far more effective than what current treatment protocols are in place. They, currently, prescription meds, when we were talking about mental health issues, they're about 20 to 25 percent effective. Our treatment protocols are 70 percent effective based off peer-reviewed data. Thank you. Good to see you lads again. Um, I applaud your passion, your commitment. We've had numerous conversations over the last year. Um, the fundraising portion of it seems to, uh, I would expect it to be larger at this point in time. And we've also talked about um, assistance from the United States government, namely the uh, armed forces. Yeah. And so I'd like to understand where the reaction of the military is, uh, because this is, they've got the funding, and you're going to need significantly more funding than where we are in where you are at this life stage. Uh, yes, we are going to need significantly more funding. Our first phase of operations, we estimate, and pretty accurate estimation, that it's going to cost $350,000 to get 20 veterans through. There's a little wiggle room there because every single veteran is different because we treat based on their blood scans and their uh, blood scans and their brain scans. Um, the, we are currently working with uh, Mount Carmel uh, to do a joint grant that's just started in the works this week. Uh, we are also providing a lot of the funds from our own separate construction business. So we are working on funding this ourselves and getting outside grants. Uh, you know, the big thing is we, like I said, we just finished treating our second patient. After treatment, it takes 30 days to get that second brain scan because we want the brain to heal uh, a little bit more. So we, he is getting his second brain scan uh, in the first week of May. We, we didn't start fundraising, Jamie, until uh, late December of just this past year. That's, that's when we started raising funds, so just over 90 days, about 120 days ago. 120 days. Thanks, guys. Okay. Who's next? Who's after in-stream? I have after in-stream brains. Will you please give me a, like, countdown, like a ready set? Oh, can I give you that? Yeah, or whoever's starting yeah, the timer. Yeah, I'll give you that. Ready, set, go. Yeah. Were you saying something? Sorry. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so we'll give the judges a second to fill out their sheets. Um, up next is in-stream water, and then on deck after that is... Brand standing, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Hey there, my name is Paul Hunter. And I'm Patrick Monkey. We're with InStream Water, a convenient, affordable, and sustainable solution to bottled water. We appreciate you guys being here tonight in support of sustainable innovations like ours. This is a 16-year-old boy in Kenya, helping to clear plastic waste from a field where it has been dumped by the failing recycling infrastructure. When China stopped accepting recyclables from the United States, the US found what they would like to call a solution. We started shipping our plastic waste, largely comprised of single-use plastic bottles, to Kenya. 
And while this might seem disconnected from you, the average American uses 167 single-use bottles every year. That amounts to 1,500 plastic bottles every second for the United States. And when it became clear that Kenya didn't have the infrastructure to deal with our plastic waste, large corporations started throwing money at the problem. Corporations like Coca-Cola threw $360,000 last year into single-use bottle recycling in Kenya. Now to the average consumer, it might sound like a lot of money, but it only begins to tackle the 52 million pounds of plastic waste we shipped to Kenya last year. And the craziest part, this is plastic that's used for just a few minutes. But this is the current story, one in which underfunded and exploited recycling initiatives in third world countries funded by large corporations are left to clean up after Americans and the waste we produce. As a Regis student and a Colorado native, I grew up surrounded by nature. I recognize our shortcomings and the need to take bold progressive action for our future and the future of our environment without exploiting marginalized populations. As a fellow Colorado native and proud dad to two little boys, I'm committed to providing a more sustainable future for the next generation. They say we don't inherit the planet from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And that's exactly why we started In Stream Water, to create and imagine a new story, one with less plastic waste. We make a filtered water refill station that dispenses triple filtered still and sparkling water, dispensed from a hygienic source in a sustainable way for 75% less than the cost of bottled water. The only caveat, you have to bring your own reusable bottle. Customers can access fully filtered water for between one and three cents an ounce. And as proud of these refill stations as we are, we're even prouder of the transaction platform we've engineered that allows customers to transact effortlessly at any in-stream station. We've built a smart water bottle that has an embedded passive microchip that allows customers to load and store account information, like account balance and dispensing preferences, directly onto their smart bottle. We make it easy. You download our app, put one, five, maybe 10 bucks on your account, um, set your dispensing preferences inside the app. I happen to have a 20 ounce bottle. I like sparkling water. I've set that as my dispensing preference. Using my smartphone, I wirelessly transfer the information from the app onto the embedded microchip in my smart water bottle. When I show up at any in-stream station, place my bottle on the fill platform, our software recognizes me, automatically dispenses my 20 ounces of sparkling water, debits my account by the transaction amount, and I take my bottle and walk away. And if you already have a reusable bottle that you know, or that you use and love, we have a silicone band that has the same technology that allows you to transact the same way at any of our stations. We're different from current refill stations and the quality of our water and the cleanliness of our stations. I don't know if you've been to a free refill station recently, but they're typically crusted over with bacteria-rich mineral deposits, and many of them don't actually have filters. To me, giving my body water that is truly filtered and free from bacteria and microplastics is important. And we're not the only ones that value this differentiation. We conducted a beta test a couple months ago with 63 users over 12 days and dispensed over 15,000 ounces of water. We just installed our first paid pilot at a high school here in Colorado. The average customer loaded $6.41 on their account, and we dispensed 3,000 ounces of water in just the first four days of our pilot. To put it in perspective, that's over 200 single-use bottles that avoided the solid waste stream in just the first four days. Packaging and distribution costs are part of what make bottled water so expensive and resource intensive. We don't incur these costs, which means that we can achieve a gross profit margin of 87%. Our long-term vision is an expansive network of 1,500 refill stations. Dispensing an average of 100,000 ounces per month, our annual reoccurring revenue would be $50 million. But we have a ways to go before we get there. Money from the Innovation Challenge will help us divert 71,000 plastic bottles from the landfill while collecting valuable information from our customers to better improve our product and better serve our customers. Our current waste stream is broken. Dumping our recycling waste on third world countries is not and should not be an option. It is each of our responsibilities to reduce our consumption, especially in the realm of single-use plastics. InStream is a tool that aims to empower our customers to do just that all while giving them access to higher quality water at a more affordable price. Thank you all for your time, and thank you for the Regis Innovation Center for this opportunity. Great job, guys. Quick question. How do you plan to create some critical mass that it, so it would make sense for me as a consumer to buy a bottle to get a wristband, something along those lines? So it's all about density, to your point. We have to create a dense network where people can reliably expect to interact with a refill station throughout their day. So the idea is to partner with municipalities and institutions like zoos, hospitals, commuter paths, RTD, universities, to install uh, several refill stations in a dense area. 
Got another one, sorry. How do you, um, when you find those dense stations, are you, uh, let's assume uh, a Coke or a Pepsi, PepsiCo come in and want to do the same thing. How would you compete against somebody like that? So we, there's nothing proprietary about the refill station itself. It's plumbing. Um, they're fully IoT connected, and we remotely manage and manipulate everything in the station. So we know exactly how much water's come into the station. We know the filter life of every station all remotely. Um, there's some technology certainly in that, but we're patent pending on the transaction piece. That's that embedded microchip in a bottle. You can't uh, allow customers just to use a credit card because you'll get eaten alive on merchant fees. It's 20 cents minimum to process a credit card. So they would need our technology in order to allow their customers to access Coke or Pepsi, Aquafina, or Dasani. What's the cost for each of the dispensing units and um, all in, not just the cost, the, the actual unit itself, but putting it in, maintaining it, all of those sorts of things. And then how many uses would you have to sell before you get that paid for? Sure, good question. So we, um, the refill stations to manufacture are currently $15,000 each. And we make them here in Colorado, in Golden. Uh, with economies, we can get that down to 10000 just over $10,000, just by volume orders. Uh, it costs about $1,500 or $2,000 to install the refill stations. And then the maintenance is almost, it's, it's very little because we're remotely monitoring all that. And our filters are enormous. So they have a 14,000 gallon capacity. We only have to service those based on our current data about every six months. So there's not a lot of cost. We're not wasting time and money going out and actually looking at the refill station. We know exactly what's going on with them remotely in our dashboard. How long is the payback? The payback's about six months at dispensing, at dispensing 100,000 ounces a month. Uh, it seems capital intensive for the unit, but um, what would you do with the $10,000? Yeah, so the $10,000 would help us install a refill station on in an environment where we would be able to um, capture some of this data. So for example, installing a unit at Regis University where students would find benefit in purchasing a bottle and using it at a station that's in a place where they frequent. Um, so the $10,000 would help us do that. In addition, with that, we would divert 71,000 um, bottles per year from the landfill. So we installed our first uh, pilot just a week ago um, at a high school, and we have four total refill stations manufactured currently. I, I, I'm sorry. Um, would you consider branding it? Uh, we would consider it, sure, sure. There are certainly some beverage companies that have some pretty um, uh, impressive brands that we would consider partnering in one way or another with current yeah. brands. Same question in licensing? Correct. Yeah, because they'll need our transaction technology and that's, we're, that's fully proprietary. Thank if you guys. Oh, I was going to say, if there aren't any other questions, I'm sure a question that many people may have is why would you use this over another station, um, like free refill stations? We already talked about the differentiation, but we also offer sparkling water, which is a great differentiating factor. And then we also feed data back into the application. So as a user, you can monitor the quantity of water intake and then also the number of plastic bottles that you've saved. You need all the things. Uh, all of the you things. can keep your iPad. I will oh, keep actually, I would love the iPad, but I'll give you. Okay. So again, the judges will tally for a second. Um, up next, we have brand standing, and then on deck is rock and rides. <laughs> We had a whole like thing planned, some audio, but we're we're just gonna start. So, in 2019, LinkedIn identified three things: creativity, persuasion, and collaboration as the most important things for job seek for people seeking jobs. I'm Ryan Bow. This is Chris Pesegan. We're with Brand Standing, and we started with a simple question: What would you name a company for a specific demographic? The thesis was is if we humored this question a little bit, we might get some chuckles. For example, what would you name a dating app for Mall Santas? <laughs> <laughs> is gift giving your love language? 
But to get serious, people are more disconnected than they were ever in the human history. And we have a rising entrepreneurial culture that's looking for resources. And game-based learning is on the horizon. What we thought was we could bring people together to innovate, to pitch, and to compete. Think Cards Against Humanity and Shark Tank, or innovation competition, has a child. We call it brand standing. And so the concept is pretty simple. You get two industry cards, two demographic cards, and you choose one of each. Then, over the course of five rounds, you identify and pitch and create a business based on those specific focuses. And from those focuses, people then give you money or investment, uh, and that's how you win. And there are two different ways to win. One is by getting the company that has the most investment, and the other way is by being the lead investor. And being the lead investor means you invest in that particular company. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of competitors, but what a lot of them do is they're improv games. They let you pitch a name and maybe a little bit of a product. But what we wanted to do was incorporate the entrepreneur's journey. When an entrepreneur wakes up in the morning, they don't think, what's the name of my business every day? They try and develop a traditional marketing plan. They try and figure out what their strategic partnerships are going to be. They try and figure out what their online branding is going to look like. And that's what we incorporated in each individual round in this game. So we're looking to do this with two verticals. We have the B2C and B2B. Meet James. James is a socialite. He loves getting together with friends and family to play games. It turns out James is a growing demographic. Sharon. Sharon is the executive director of an accelerator. And I know this pain personally because I went through the Techstars Accelerator at 2018. And from that, we didn't start pitching our businesses to week seven, week eight. And it was our businesses. It was our baby. If we would have had other businesses, fun businesses that we could have pitched in week one or week two, that would have helped us develop that skill set. Finally, we have Matthew. Matthew works with Fortune 500 companies and helps their employees tell better stories. People like Matthew are always looking for additional tools and resources to add value to their clients. And so we operate on a framework. Ideate, create, validate, and scale. On the B2C model, we validated with over 100 play tests and 500 users. 97% gave positive feedback. 67% said they would go out and play the game again. Um, on the B2B side, we're in the validate stage. So what we want to do is validate how do we create the perfect product for academia, for accelerators, for professional services. And so we're in the process, that discovery process, to validate this is something they want. This is our, our experience, and with this experience, we will have the best team to make this happen. The reality is, is over the last five months, we've hit some pretty big milestones. We made money, yay. <laughs> we printed 50 games, which is that once you hit that threshold in the game business, that's a big, that's a big milestone. And we made two strategic partnerships. One is with Chicago IO. It's a big improv house in Chicago. The second is with the engaging educator. And this is a professional services company tailored for female executives and entrepreneurs. And so if you think about it, how would we use the 10 grand? Well, we're pushing towards the Kickstarter. So $2,500 would be used towards sales and marketing. Five grand would be used towards tweaking the B2B type product. And the rest would be used for inventory management. Coupled with the fundraising that we would get from the Kickstarter, that would kind of be the, what we would need to create the next project. And one major thing we left out was we just launched a podcast with Chicago IO and the Engaging Entrepreneur, and this is to help get interest for the Kickstarter in May, and we have a live show at Chicago IO. Now, if you're interested in learning more about brand standing, it seems that Regis has provided you with a tool, but you can also uh, text eat people to 63566 because there's a certain professor in the Innovation Center that gave a pitch about cannibals. Not going to name who, but think, if you're interested. Ryan, wasn't it dry cleaning cannibal business? I, yeah, it was. I it was. Okay. Dry cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> so that. also, if you guys are interested in buying a game, you can also text eat people to that number. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And a special thanks to Kenton. 
Oh, and also we'd like to introduce the CEO and the person, the creator of the game, Tony Vicenda as well, on stage. Uh, it, what's your sales model? Where do you plan to sell this? In locations, online? What's your plan there? So we're going to start on Kickstarter, and the idea is to sell online. Most board games are being sold online, opposed to retail stores and re retail locations. B2B model is a little different, so what we're going to do is basically build a sales funnel or a sales process specifically for the target demographics we named. So academia, go out and reach out to universities, uh, accelerators, etc. One, one last one here. Do you feel like um, your market's too broad? I, I don't think so. Uh, I think from a B2C perspective, that gives us validation, that gives us a platform, right? So that now people have heard of us. I think in the, the B2B space, really what we're doing is, is we have to figure it out. We have to test it a little bit to understand which customer base needs this the most. I think B2C launchpad, B2B is the long-term goal because B2C realistically in this industry is one to three year product life cycle. B2B could be much longer. Help me with the numbers. What does it cost? Okay, uh, so what are your margins? And I didn't quite get any of that. So the game itself costs thirty bucks, seven dollar, or costs seven dollars. We're making thirty dollars of revenue on that with a seventy-five percent gross margin. Hey, sorry. Was it? It's a seventy-five percent gross margin. Once we hit economies of scale, seven dollars is the um, initial value. If we produce about a thousand units, but once we hit economies of scale. Price would drop to four to five dollars or even lower, which would give us that seventy-five percent margin. Yes. We're no, we're, yes. Yeah. Yes. Correct. Well, yes, we're selling it for thirty. Sorry. Was the that. question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What's the sales force look like? What did how, I mean? I get the the details of where you go with it for online sales, but how many in a pack? I mean, give me a little bit more color on where you'd go with that. So I think if you want to jump into the partnerships. Yeah, so, so for Kickstarter, for example, we've created a multi-dimensional viral marketing campaign through these partnerships with the engaging educator with Chicago IO. I mean, people like Tina Fey went through Chicago IO. So we're getting some really good reach um, from that perspective, and that's going to drive people to the Kickstarter starter, so that they can purchase the game risk-free. So if you're thinking about it from strategic partnership with uh, Engaging Educator, they've got a whole email list of people that they're going to go out and send this out to. Um, we've got a list, personally, from other businesses of about 25,000 um, that we can go out and use that list to, to market the game as well. Follow-up. Uh, you, you said you made some money. How much money did you make? So we had a five-day test. Of that test, we made about $1,200. And then we closed it down immediately because what we wanted to do is funnel everybody to the Kickstarter. It's a, a kind of viral, like the more people that you have going through Kickstarter, the, the better it looks. Have you received any feedback? Can you review what you shared? Tons of feedback. So uh, Chris may have spoken to it. Well, yeah, yeah so um, as a game designer, I've done most of the primary play testing. So um, the response rate we've got has been incredibly high. Like I, even as the creator, as somebody who loves the game, was blown away. I think one of the earliest ones, um, lots of times the game industry is dominated by um, men. And so we had one of our first um, female players. Her response was, I've always wanted this game to exist. It was a game she felt like she could immediately gravitate to, grab onto, and it's something she'd always wanted to. Um, a lot of our business partners, as well as a lot of the groups that we work with that do team building, skill building for people of all ages um, who have test played it, um, have planned on buying numerous units for um, uh, churches, for schools, for other groups like that from a middle school up through adult uh, level. So the immediate response has typically been, can I buy this right away? Or how quickly can I get a copy of this? Um, obviously, we get some critical feedback. A lot of the play test is designed to refine that, and so the final prototype version has taken that into account. Um, it has now gone out to a major game reviewing groups um, who we've gotten initial very positive results from um, on it. What's the response you want from your customer avatar? Um, so I, we want them to be as critical as possible. Um, for, from a B2C to, B to, B to perspective, the biggest thing that we expect to hear is like, hey, we don't like uh, how long it takes, or we don't like these and that, and so we've tweaked the game to kind of refine those things. We want people to be as critical as possible from... 
I'm talking about the customer, people that buy it. What do you want them to say? What do we want them to what? Sorry. Is it a learning experience? Is it fun? Is it? Yeah, there's kind of a, oftentimes this negative view on educational games. Um, the reality is that when well designed, an educational market has grown a whole lot because fun is an essential part and something you can't sacrifice in that. So it's been, well, I want to play again is the biggest thing. So typically people play two or three rounds at a time. Okay, so up next we have Rock and Rides and then on deck the Nest. I do want to buy it. Okay. All right, cool. We're gonna let the judges finish. Uh, a couple things you should know. We have uh, all different kinds of students at Regis. We have students that show up in our classrooms. We have students that are online. We have students like Ryan Bow, who lived in Denver, got accepted to school, and then moved to Chicago for work. And so our competition's open to all of those students. And if you make the finals, people like Ryan, we fly him in so that he can pitch in front of the judges and you. Alrighty, good evening everyone. <laughs> My name is Jordan McKnight, and I moved up to Denver three years ago for two reasons. The first reason was for an education, and the second was to experience some great live music. Now during my time here in Denver, I've been to 13 concerts at Red Rocks Amphitheater. And every time I go, I experience the same problem. And that's how am I gonna get to and from the venue? Now, the way I see it, there's three options. The first one, you can get an Uber to and from the venue, which will cost you about $120 in total. The second one, you can have a DD or a friend come and get you. And the third one, unfortunately, is people will choose to drive intoxicated from the venue. And that is why I founded Rock and Rides. So Rock and Rides is a limo bus service that offers three different ticket options for every single show at Red Rocks. So we pick up on uh, our first concert is May 18th, 2019, and we'll be picking up near an RTD light rail station out in Old Town, Arvada. So our first package is our basic ride package. That's $46 round trip ticket. Our second one is our meal package. Now with the meal package, you get a sandwich, chips, Coke products, and water for $51. And then our third package, the full experience package, is a, comes with a water bottle, a backpack, a coupon book that's digitalized um, with businesses surrounding the Old Town Arvada area, um, as well as sandwich, chips, cooked products, and water. Now our biggest competition in this market is a company called Bus to Show. Bus to Show provides school bus transportation up to Red Rocks. And what we see when we look at their reviews is things such as old buses, broken down buses, um, and overpacked buses. This woman on Yelp commented that last year she took a bus up there and it broke down three separate times on her. <laughs> and so, yeah. <laughs> um, and so what our research tells us is that 29 to 49% of the people going up there are between the ages of 15 and 27. That's the market that Bus to Show hits. But 51 to 71% of the market is over the age of 27. That's the market that we want to hit. And the reason that I'm telling you this is because last year, Bus to Show served 23,000 people. We hope that with our improved business model, we can take control of the larger portion of the market. Now, since our last pitch in December, we've made leaps as a company. And that started with filing an escort back in January. After that, we locked in a contract with a bus company called Colorado Limo Charter, who, with their fleet, can give us access. If we have 16 people, we can accommodate it. If we have 800 people, we can accommodate it. We also have a fully functioning website that's very user friendly. Um, and we just locked in a parking area down in Old Town Arvada out of Harkins Movie Theater where our buses will be picking up. We also have been working to get 10 strategic partnerships with companies that are in Old Town Arvada to swap advertising for one another. And then finally, on the uh, 1st of May, we are going to be bringing on a chief financial officer and a chief marketing officer who are both Regis students. Now, in our first year, we looked to get 6,000 writers. Now, that might sound like a lot at first, but when you really look at it, it's exactly 0.0063% of all the people who will go up there, not even a full percent. If we hit this, our end of the year profits after all expenses will range from 79,000 
$695 to $119,956. Now moving forward begins for us by bringing on some extra help. Over the past month, I've been to probably 15 different classes talking to students about employment opportunities within my company. Starting next week, we will begin the interview process for seven different candidates who have expressed interest in working for me this summer. The next thing we're gonna be doing is aggressively advertising and selling our tickets as our website is completely functional and we are ready to go at this point um, for our launch date on May 18th. Then one year out, what our goal is is to purchase our own bus. This will greatly reduce our cost. Three years out, we hope to expand to other venues in the Denver area such as sporting events and other concert venues. And then the plan is in five years that we can take what we've made here and replicate it for another venue, another state, another area, and make this a nationwide business. Our startup costs total $8,486. With the innovation grant, we would be covered on all of our startup costs. Now what I'll ask you guys to think about is if you want a company that will fit great into the Denver business community, but also be responsible for building up Regis students and developing Regis students, then Rock and Rides is the number one choice for this innovation grant. Thank you. That was great. Um, just a quick question. Did I get it right? You're doing this first to Red Rocks? Yes, just to Red Rocks. So uh, what is the plan for non-season use? And you have a seasonal type of venue there. Yeah, definitely. So for this first year, um, you know, a lot of bus companies in this area, they do everything. And they do a poor job of doing everything. I want to do a really good job of doing this one thing. And I think when we have that end period, you know, the four months where not a whole lot's going on, it'll give me and the company a great opportunity to kind of look back, figure out what we did, and figure out how to improve it for the next year. And that's okay for the first two years. Then once we, you know, move out a little bit, we'll be doing sporting events, and it will become a year-long business. So just a quick follow-up. On your numbers, you show that the bus costs $180,000. Is that right? That's correct. So are you able to cover in a eight month period or during the season of concerts and events at Red Rocks that cost for such a short period of time? See, the great thing is, is that we're not locked in to anything. We pay per person that gets on the bus a rate. And because of the business that we're bringing them, we get a discounted rate. So if something weren't to work, we, we don't, we're not locked into that 180,000. That's just kind of an estimate based on the 6,000 people that we're projecting to have. So how many people in the average bus does this? Well, so we have buses that are 16 seaters, 20, 24, 28, 35, 48, and a 50 seater. So okay, what are the logistics? Do you meet somewhere? Do you get picked up? Yep, so it's at a Harkins movie theater, Old Town, Arvada. That's our pickup location. Um, and yeah, basically when you go on the website, you can purchase a ticket. It sends you an itinerary. It sends you a ticket confirmation. Then one day before the event, it sends you a reminder, this is where you're going. Um, as well as like the coupon book is going to be digital. Um, so you'll be able to get your coupons, go have one for two beers, whatnot. And then in the 180000 is insurance and driver included in that cost? Okay. It is. The bus company we're working with has put us on their insurance. So we're covered under there. Um, they cover the bus cost. They cover the gas cost. They cover everything. You mentioned that, I think you said 20, you've done 23000 no, so the, the other bus company, Bus to Show, our main competition, okay. last year, that's what they did, is 23000 over the course of the year. Okay, I yeah. was unclear about that. So I'm, I'm still a little confused in your relationship. Do you have a contract with the bus company, and what happens when gas goes up in the summertime by 30 cents a gallon, and what is that going to do to your costs? Do you have... You said you don't have any um, hard ironclad stuff. You, you just get charged per person that gets on the bus. What controls do you have that those costs don't go up? Well, basically, they have the largest fleet of buses here in Colorado. And when their buses don't go out, they don't make money. So by us bringing customers to them, they've locked in. They've agreed to this rate. We do have a contract with them. They've sent me a contract um, stating it's $30 as soon as I hit 30 people. If it's 
15 people, it's $37. So there, there is a little bit, you know, as we get down the line, but as long as we're hitting 30 people a show, it's 30 bucks. So effectively, I mean to oversimplify, but you're a reseller for the bus company. Yeah, essentially, you know, people, you wouldn't be able to, less, if they were gonna sell you this bus, let's say you wanted to get a bus, right? Mm -hmm. They would charge you $44, $46 a seat on there, you know? But due to the volume that I'll be bringing them, they've given me a discount down to where then I pay the $30 as long as I'm hitting 30 people. Um, but yeah, essentially. What does your back end logistics look like? Do you have a website that's logistically pulling these together? You know, when you can make money? What if you only have one person? Is the bus still gonna operate with one person or a smaller group? Um, yeah, so our website um, has come together really well. And it does all of our, you know, we have all of our books on the website, everything is on there. Um, and the reason that we are bringing on a chief marketing officer here is because if one person comes, it's not gonna work, you know? Um, we need 12, a minimum of 12, you know, 12 people to make this work. And I don't think that's gonna be difficult to get. I had a question more yes. about the, uh, your competitor, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but what is your differentiator, again, based on them even going to the bus company themselves or renting out the bus themselves? Like, really, what's your differentiator? So they use school buses. We use limo buses, like, like that. So they use school buses. We use nicer buses. They don't offer any added benefits. So you get a school bus, that's it. You know, we offer dinner, backpacks, coupon books, a nicer pickup area, um, just a lot of added benefits that you wouldn't get through them. Okay, so the cost to, if I wanted to rent that bus without going through you, right? is there a difference in price? Well, this is a 50-seater bus that you see up here, and they would charge you about $44 a ticket for 50 seats, so that would be 3200 to get this bus, we get the bus for 25. So we make about $700 off of that bus. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Good job. You did great. Okay. Okay. So up next, we have The Nest, and then HZ Logic is on deck. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Before we begin, take a look around the room. Notice who is sitting here in this room. Though we sit here as a community, statistics show that actually 50% of the population is lonely. We are currently experiencing a loneliness epidemic. Half of the people in this room feel that they have no support system to fall back upon in times of struggle. We are the nest, and we believe in the healing power of community. We create three-day therapeutic retreats for women to come together to heal, grow, and create authentic human connection. Before we begin, we'd like to introduce ourselves. This is Cameron Walton. She is a nonprofit professional who also has her own Reiki and energy healing practice. And this is Hannah Buzzo. She's a therapist who believes in the power of holistic mental health. And this is Kate Polly, a certified yoga teacher and master student here at Regis University. Last year, we wanted to go on a retreat. So we did some research and we found that retreats in Colorado range from $600 to over $3,500 for a three-day retreat. We simply could not afford to go on a retreat 
So we decided to create our own. We wanted to create a low cost retreat and what we ended up doing was empowering every single woman who came on our retreat to lead a workshop. This actually fostered deeper human connection because our women were leading retreats, leading workshops on trauma-informed yoga, meditations, art therapy, and energy healing. The women who left our retreat went home empowered. They made actual positive and healthy changes in their lives and are living healthier and better lives today. I want to share a quote with you from one of our retreat attendees that sums up the power of our retreats. This weekend was a weekend of female empowerment, divine connection, and intentional creation, a return to nature, to our bodies, and to the depths of our souls. We shared, we laughed, we cried, we found each other, and then we found ourselves. Through this, we have found that real spiritual growth and personal healing happens when we remove ourselves from the day-to-day -day responsibilities, immerse ourselves in nature, and retreat as a community. Over the past six months, we've experienced a ripple effect. We felt empowered to host an additional 40 workshops, reaching more than 150 women. And through this experience, we've discovered that community truly is a basic human need that is lacking in over half of the population. Therefore, the mission of The Nest is twofold. One, to offer therapeutic retreats for all women to have a safe space to heal, connect, and evolve. And two, to ensure that those retreats are accessible and affordable to all women, regardless of their background or financial situation. The women who leave our retreats have a community who truly loves and supports them. They are then officially members of the nest. They trust in our services, and they will promote us and return to us later in life. We then surveyed our nest community, and we learned that they are willing and able to spend $300 per three-day retreat, which costs us $150 per person to create. On average, our retreats bring in 15 people, so that means we will be profiting $2,250 per retreat that we can then reinvest back into the organization. With the $10,000 from the Regis Challenge, we would create a scholarship fund. We want to provide scholarships to 30 women who still cannot afford our cheap retreats. These women are people who cannot afford yoga classes. These are people who cannot afford therapy. These are women who in their wildest dreams could not imagine coming on a three-day healing retreat. We'd also use a portion of the money for marketing tools, retreat supplies like art materials and yoga mats, and we want to work with a local nutritionist to curate a menu just for our retreats. With your investment, you'll directly impact the lives of 30 women and positively affect the lives of so many more. With your investment, you will. Return 30 women back to nature. Connect 30 women to their bodies. And empower 30 women. You're good. Tom's up. <laughs> empower 30 women. <laughs> that was great. I, I'm a little jealous that we don't have one for the men going back to the NASCAR. <laughs> That's um, future. <laughs> you, you talk a little bit, of, can you talk a little bit about the numbers and what you've done because um, strong margins, 50% margins, uh, and it sounds like you are doing this with some success already. Yeah, so every single week we've been hosting a workshop since we started the Regis Innovation Challenge. Um, for now, we've been hosting these workshops for free. We've been doing this to get our brand out there and to really get women familiar with who we are and what type of work we do. Um, we have a vision to start um, allowing people to offer donations for these free workshops. Where we do see the money coming in is through the retreats. Our long-term vision is to actually purchase a retreat center so that all of that money can be coming back into the nest and to even open a holistic healing center in Denver so that we can do this work without bringing women outside of the Denver community. Um, 
Not particularly. So we hosted the first retreat more as a pilot, um, and we just cost we covered the cost of the retreat, which was the hundred and fifty dollars, and that's what we could do for three days. Um, and so we have the next retreat scheduled. Um, we have started collecting names, but not money yet, and so um, we don't have any current profits. Quick math, if uh, if I understand correctly, uh, forty workshops a year. Fifteen. 40 Okay, so so how many can you do in a year? Workshops or retreats? Yeah. Retreats. So we're planning on doing four retreats a year to start, um, so one with every season. So I, I, you got $300 per person, $150 profit. Um, I don't have line of sight to anything more than sixty to $70,000 in total volume. And profits of thirty to forty. How, how many people is this going to employ? How are you going to, how are you going to scale this? And I, I get it, love the idea, but there was a similar uh, business proposed a year ago, and a wonderful business model, but um, no line of sight to any real significant capital and gross sales. Um, so with the four retreats a year, that would be with us leading them to start. This model that we have implemented could actually be used for anybody that we train to lead these retreats. So we could actually see this happening once a weekend, um, especially if we had a retreat center that we could use ourselves. Additionally, we do want to ask for funding. Because we want to operate as a nonprofit, we want all of our funds going back into our business. We do plan to do some fundraising and also receive grants. Um, like I mentioned, one of our long-term visions is really having a holistic healing center in Denver where we can be doing all of this work, offering these workshops, and having um, several different healers under one roof. So we're all healers in our own right. We have a vision for when we bring women into our um, holistic healing center, working with them so that they can access all of the different types of holistic healing that we offer from yoga all the way to EMDR and other types of therapy. So women are a very hot demographic today. And so with that, there's a... <laughs> <laughs> with that, <laughs> okay. <laughs> with that, uh, there is a lot of noise coming at women, and with technology and social media and kind of this 24-hour cycle. So, how, talk to me a little bit about some of the strategies you guys are doing to try to penetrate some of that to really hit the people you need to kind of take part in these retreats. Yeah, I think part of the reason we've really implemented the workshops, weekly workshops, is to really get that branding out there and create this safe space for women to really feel like they can come in, even if they don't have a friend to come in with to a workshop. Or maybe they're interested in taking a nutrition class, but they're scared to go alone. We really want to establish ourselves as a safe space for any woman to be able to come. And we do have a social media platform set up. And we are, I think, our biggest way of doing that is just through retreats and word of mouth, honestly. And and just the workshops that we continually put on to get the Nest branding out there. So many conferences today, their margin is post-conference. So it's on things that you're selling there. Do you have any plans for or ideas around coaching or certification or anything along those lines? We've yeah. definitely <laughs> talked about that. And that's something that we're very interested in doing long term for sure. Okay, so we're getting close to the end. Um, our next team is A to Z Logic, and then on deck after that is Pen Quest Golf. Um, if you got a shirt and it's not the right size, at the end you can come down and we can see if we have a size that you'd prefer, that you can swap it, just an FYI. Judges are finishing up. You need noise if you want a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Off the 
Hello, everybody. Does this work? Hello, everybody. My name is Nick Mazor, and I'm with A to Z Logic. Can I get a round of applause for everyone that has participated so far? Thank you. First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to God for allowing me to be here. A to Z Logic, what do we do? We take enterprise security to mid to small size businesses. Why? So you can free up your time to focus on your business needs. At the beginning of this innovation, that was one of the main questions. What do you do for your security? At that time, our company was in the middle of a blockchain making full stack development. It has then pivoted into request your $100 security assessment today. Can anyone go back to 1988? Does anyone know what a phone book is? <laughs> At that time, it was $5 for cybersecurity or security of location and your address. It was simple. You just didn't list your phone number in your phone book. The internet changed everything. And the breaches have happened. They started in 2013 in December with Target. And believe it or not, they were fully compliant. They passed all the audits. We've had a couple breaches since then. 200 million, 200 million, and 200 million. This is the law of depreciating return. It goes the wrong way. So what is the problem? Cost is the number one problem. Quality of service matching with cost of security with the level of security. And that's the model that's coming out is a hybrid with cloud. And so why is this important? The DOD just came out two weeks ago with seeing the problem was with contract and holding the data from contract to contract. And they were not even auditing some of these contractors. And so they brought out a pilot program of $15 million to build a cloud security so that businesses can focus on their needs rather than security. Excuse me. The second problem is the know-how. A lot of these startups, even in this innovation challenge, do not have the know-how to focus on the security. That's where we come in. We bring military-grade security requirements to a secure cloud environment. So what is that minimal viable product? What are we protecting? That's exactly what we do. We sit down with business owners, residential owners, and we sit down and we talk about concerns. And it's a verbal assessment. We talk about your clients' concerns, about your concerns. And this is the whole initiative is to free up your time so small businesses have their data secured. And we do follow DOD security standards and requirements. So why now and why me? I showed you the model of the million dollars and the breaches that are happening. They're only going to get worse. What we provide is a pre-configured server. Well, here's where it gets interesting. Because remember when I was talking about the level of security? Each business has, has different levels of security. Um, HIPAA compliant is uh, healthcare records. Um, lawyers have different data that they need secured. And so it's going to change from customer to customer. And believe it or not, that is what I found the most beneficial part about this innovation challenge. It was the problem on my side, but it was also what was necessary to happen. And do you know what that was? It's talking with CEOs about cybersecurity. I love talking cybersecurity with people. My mentor, he has a $2 million cloud SaaS. I was able to find four components that he could add on and strengthen his security posture. So we do vulnerability assessments. And with this mass, does anyone know what mass is? 
machine as a service. What that does is it connects from a server to a node end-to-end -end point encryption. And so if that's what you need, we'll build that for you. So by 2020, awesome. if you... Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Time's up. Can you explain to me your customer size, industry? It would be, I was told five million plus uh, when I was doing the vulnerability assessments. But now as I transfer it into this uh, secure network, it would be residential to consumer to mid-sized business. And then how do you price that? It, I heard about the assessment, but how do you mm -hmm. price security based on that after that? That's a very good question. So I've talked with three real estate. One of the associations I want to get into is the real estate association. And it prices about $400 um, with the current person. He's using Broker Mint, um, Google Enterprise, and something else for the CPA data. And so that is about $400 as a total service cost for him. And that's just taking over his uh, customer base. Um, another uh, real estate person was $50, but he got into the security of his phone. And that's where I went to, I always have to go a step above. And that's where I went to the securing it from the node to the server. And with that, I would use Ubuntu and Snap as an app. Um, you're, you're specifically targeting what, just the cloud services? Is there anything else that, when you said hybrid, so I would assume that it's going to be on-prem and in cloud, what are all the components that you're covering then? The components. So it, you're saying phone and mm -hmm. what else would... It depends on the level of security that the customer needs. Um, for instance, like the hybrid model, that would be you know, two home-based premises. Um, and so that'd be, so that'd be the, the, like building out the system. So like a server here and a server here, that'd be kind of the home-based system. And then you'd build that out that way. Does that make any sense? Yes, yes. Because that is one of the main questions with the hybrid cloud model. Um, and that's where we're getting into is the security of those. Because honestly, when you have a container, I don't want to get too technical. <laughs> But yes, it would, uh, it's, it's bringing the data on site instead of letting it in a data center. Okay. And you were saying earlier, you're more SMB and mid-market, correct? Business to business. And if residentials want us to, we can. Um, that's where I'd put the 24-hour uh, video surveillance on as well. So we do all a cart. If you want added services, so it really depends on the customer. If it's residential, they really just need the router configured. If you're into a business, you talk about point of sale, uh, human resource documents, and you get into different data concerns. Um, the real estate market is really what I wanted to get into, and that's where I've started to, and so we'll see where this goes. I would start building out the Ubuntu servers, and then also market. I'd put this into marketing. Excuse me? It's just me right now. Um, in the pivot of this innovation, um, I started with two other people, and I cut one, and my partner left with him. So they might have had a tie, so I had to get through that. And that's where I pivoted from blockchain, because blockchain takes a whole another concept instead of a cloud. So it takes it to another level. It's BASS, blockchain as a service instead of machine. So it's just me right now. Um, I would hire people, um, possibly. If probably internships would be the best way. Um, really, what I would need would be an engineer uh, to double check me as I pre configure that server and then drop it on another one. Um, I'm very well skilled with VMware and pushing images, so I can do that. Um, but yeah, basically, the money would be for marketing and then also to get the servers up and running. Mm -hmm. You have experience in containerizing, you understand the Kubernetes AWS. a little bit, yes. yeah. So um, 
I own a tech company, so I can get real technical with you, Let's but do I, it. I don't want it for audience. So I, I think that there's a lot of empty holes here that you need from understanding cybersecurity, not that you don't understand it, but for uh, just a lay person that you're talking to as a mm -hmm. business. And the assessment to sales engineer, to pre-sales, to installation, to integration, to their entire system, whether it's hybrid, on-prem, or in the cloud. Uh -huh. Can you just help us understand the revenue model around that? Because there's so many players in there. Are you going to partner with the VAR? Are you going to partner with AWS? Where, do you, where are you going with the revenues? Oh, man, the revenue model. <laughs> Blank check. Um, okay. Okay. So we have two more. Hang in there. Um, we have PinQuest Golf up next. And then our finale is Camp Creek. Oh, sure, sure. We won't. Hi, I'm Steve Newman, co founder of PinQuest Golf. This is Jennifer Shills. She's our intern from Phoenix. This is Zanib. She's our intern from Regis out here in Denver. I got to ask a quick question. How many golfers are in the, out here? All right, good. So some of this will make sense. <laughs> I'm a golfer. Some might say I'm obsessed. Hi, honey, up there. I know you're one of them. And uh, why golf? Why do we get into the game of golf? It's multi-generational based on grandfathers playing with their grandchildren, mothers and, and fathers playing with their sons and daughters. But it, golf is in decline. It's a little troubling. Youth isn't coming back to the sport, not since Tiger Mania. I decided that when I was practicing the game of golf, I wanted to you know, get better at it. So I would buy equipment, I'd get the latest and greatest technology. In fact, $6 billion annually in the US alone is based on equipment being bought. This is just troubling because you really can't buy your, your golf game. The best way to get better at golf is through your short game or through practice with intention. This was me, let me tell you a story. Going to a short game area, if anyone knows, it's a free area in a golf course that you can go and just hit a bucket of balls, pick them up, go back and hit them again, and you're 50 yards out and you're hitting short shots. Well, the short game is 65% of your score in golf. It's the biggest bang for your buck. So I would go out there and I'd hit golf balls and I had no intention, no purpose, and they'd be everywhere. In fact, I probably hit a few people at the same time. But what I noticed was I wasn't getting any better. It wasn't translating to the golf course. So I went and looked online for apps that had a system. I read books. I looked at videos. Still, nothing was happening. So I thought to myself, gosh, if there was an app that could be developed where you could gamify it, have fun, and have a purposeful practice and get better, then more people may practice their game of golf. Well, there is now. We're PinQuest Golf. We're a subscription-based short game training app that uses GPS and promotes purposeful practice through reward-driven games and objectives. Basically, what we're trying to do here is if you can practice with some kind of purpose and have fun doing it, you may practice longer. And this is the approach that we thought we can take. This is our app. There are eight strategic areas in a short game area. We have our users play through all eight areas and get a short game index. That index rates them how good they are in their short game. It's also gonna be built with our algorithms that's gonna train them to practice their weaknesses to get through the game before they get to their strengths. You could play this in your backyard. You could play this with someone in a different town. We feel that this is important for people who want to be good at golf or get better at golf. So we decided that we're going to go through that route. 
So one surprising area of our research has come from the interest from high school golf teams, college golf teams, and golf schools and programs. We've had great positive feedback from this, and based on this interest and this feedback, we've created additional functionalities to put into our game for coaches and pros to track the progress of their students. Our app is currently in its second release in the Google and Apple stores. It is free to download, but we do have two pricing tiers, tiers. The first one is for individuals, and this is an annual premium subscription, and it comes with a bunch of extra features. And the second one is for groups, and this one comes with a license-based pricing, and it's 20 to 30 per user per year. And this includes all of the benefits from the annual prescription subscription, uh, and on top of the coaching and pro tools that I mentioned previously. These are our three markets. First market, Jen already talked about, it's the college teams and the programs. Our biggest market is going to be the consumers. There's over 38 million golfers just in America alone. And the last market is our B2B. We're going to market to the golf courses. They're going to evangelize our product. We already have three pilots with golf courses, seven pilots with high schools and colleges, and uh, two pilots with golf programs. We're not done yet. We're going to electrify this app. We're going to make it so you're going to be able to put uh, an RFID chip inside the ball and be able to just hit the shots you want and automatically score your shots with putting your phone away. Pinkless Golf App, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, you got them? Okay, thank you. This is our team, sorry. So, yeah, I think I heard second release of the app. What revenue has been generated to date from the first one? Want me to answer? Okay, so the reason why we've gone through a second release is we've been doing pilots to get feedback so we can iterate. Uh, the feedback has been very important from us from a basic technical standpoint because the app has so much metadata our metadata, that we're grabbing so much detail that the users, when they're going through the app, were getting a little lost in the shuffle. So we've backed off on any revenue, and we've just basically done releases until we can fine tune it. So, so real quick, I, I, I Sorry. appreciate what you're, you're trying to do. I'm envisioning somebody out there hitting a bunker shot, and then they go to the app, and they got to put in that they're eight feet away from the hole after they hit that bunker shot, then they hit another one, and they, how does the input work? So that's a great question. So to go through the skills test, you hit 10 balls from each individual area. Once you hit your 10 balls, the app automatically has the screens to score it. You just pop them in one, two, three, from three foot, six foot, 10 foot, and above 10 foot. That has a scoring system based on how close you are to the, to the zone of the pin. When you get close enough to the pin, you have a better shot of, of one putting. That's why you get better. So it is an automatic input, but we are going to electrify it so you don't have to manually input it at this time. Does that answer your question? OK, thank you. So in the app space, the number of apps has increased 100-fold um, year over year, and people are keeping less and less on their phone. Mm -hmm. What's your strategy to get people to download your app? Well, it's too, well, we have a social media strategy right now from the user side because we're making it more social. We want to, get, we want to gather more of the millennial crowd who still you know, texts and does all the social events. Um, we're also being more involved in the um, accommodations from a UCCS school program, which is our T PGA Pro, who has the influencer market where their golf teams are using our app and they're influencing out to all their friends and things of that nature, so we're growing in organically as well. I feel like I'm answering all the questions. <laughs> Go ahead. The question, I have a question on when you said you had a free download, mm -hmm. but then there was a price associated with it. Can you just go back to the, what the pricing model was again? Right. So the free download is we want to get the user acquisition. The pricing model, yeah. right, correct, is $31 annual or $4.99 a month. You don't need to have an annual subscription. What that includes is the gamification, a lot more analytics, um, golf reporting, um, putting contests. Am I missing anything else? It, the games and also it, there's a uh, there are leaderboards so you can see where you compare against pros. You can see where you compare against other golfers. And there's also friends and, and you can compete. The, the app is actually also set up so you can compete against people at different, different short game sites and different golf courses. And you can challenge them. 
And then there's an algorithm to balance out good players and bad players, so, <laughs> bad players, me. And um, so that you can then, you can compete. And it's, it's a little bit of a handicap type of system as well. So it's a quota ball system, if you're familiar with that, that game. So there's three options then, if I'm reading. Yes. yes. That's correct. OK. Yes. OK, that's where I was getting confused. Sorry. Okay. That's a great question. We would probably use it for our prototyping. We're going into a sensor-based system. And we're also going to put it into social media as well. So I'm sorry. I assume that some of the influence in them are, are participating with equity or something. But it seems like a large group. Why such a big group? Why have a legal person when you're just starting an app? Well, our legal person actually is a software kind of contract person. We have a lot of connections and contracts that we have to deal with in regards to some of the um, affiliate marketing that we're going to be doing. Um, a lot of these people still have other jobs as well, but they are helping us out and they're members of our LLC. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Say again, who are the big competitors? Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. In our space, in the practice side, there's really not much competition. You've seen Top Golf, that's more of a social environment, $200 million operation. So there it's just like non golfers going out and doing it. We're getting more involved in the practice of golfers who want to play the game and non-golfers who want to get introduced to the game. Uh, 18 Birdies is a live golf app for social stuff. You can go on and play while you're playing live golf and you use your app at the time on a live, you know, on a, on a golf course. We don't want to introduce phones on golf courses. We like the idea that it's a great, you know, media for us to be on a practice range. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so Camp Crete is our final one. So let's get very hyped about them. Stop Mesa. Stop. It's too late, it's too late, it's too late. Stop Mesa. Mason gave out. He, he knew, no. ready to give us the judging sheets so far so that we can start sorting them and counting them. Oh, that's my job. I got you. I'll do it. <laughs> awesome. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, now it's on. Oh, <laughs> perfect. One second. This thing working? All right, here we go. All right, thanks for sticking around. Uh, it's the last one. It's over after this. So I'm, I feel like I'm looking at a lot of tired, stressed out, overly civilized faces. And, I, and I'm, I'm in that boat too. Uh, trust me, I'm in that boat too. But thankfully, there is a solution that is so powerful and so beneficial that even doctors are beginning to prescribe it. And that is wilderness experiences like the one you see here. But if you want to plan a wilderness experience, which is basically playing outside for, for adults, there's a lot of things that get in your way. Because we as adults, we make it complicated. It's not just going and playing in the park. 
we need to have all the gear. And gear is really expensive, and there's a lot to choose from. Also, logistics. We want to plan some grand adventure. It can be really overwhelming to where you don't even try. And the outdoor industry is enormous. It's almost $900 billion that we as Americans spend every year to go play outside. That's more than we spend on Christmas and Thanksgiving put together, including airfare. Crazy. And millennials, they're changing everything, it's moving away from big ticket items like RVs and, and second houses into things that they can use, have an awesome experience, and then leave behind. Seeing this unique opportunity and this unique problem, my partner, Chad, and I decided that we wanted to build a bridge between people who wanted to have authentic outdoor experiences, but they didn't have the gear and didn't know how to plan it for themselves. Thus, Camp Crate was born. And this is what it looks like. If I can get it to switch. And this is just a screenshot from our website. Plan a trip. You pick where you want to go. We literally send you this box full of all this gear anywhere in the country. You pick it up there. You have a great time. Put everything back in the box, and it gets shipped right back to us, shipping labels included. And on our website, this is what customers will see. Scroll down to experiences. That's where we have built pre-planned, all-inclusive, self-guided itineraries. You can, all over the country, choose the one you want to go to. This one person shows Yosemite. This person's me. <laughs> it shows you an overview of what it looks like. Pictures from the trail, that's what you see. Miles, difficulty, days. Choose the number of people, go to checkout. Choose your dates. At any point you have questions, that little button on the bottom that says online, that means I have my phone on me. I will answer you right away. <laughs> Very helpful for international customers, which make up about 40%. This is what's in the box. You can also see that here. I don't expect you to read all that. Just basic backpacking gear. It is almost ultralight. It is high quality. And it's very lightweight for first timers, but it's not the gear that separates us. It's everything else we include. Highly detailed itinerary. Judges, you have a copy right there. It's about four total pages. Has QR codes in it to show you where you need to be standing for your water sources. It's that detailed. We include transportation within the parks, shuttle services or bus services. Shuttle, I meant to say shuttle. <laughs> we also teach people to hitchhike if they want that option. And we have. We, <laughs> And we have permission from the Park Service to do that. We even send you an online preparedness course. It's about an hour long. It teaches you how to do everything from poop in the woods to <laughs> protecting yourself from lightning and literally everything in between. We also include cash inside the box because when you get to the backcountry campsite, it's $7 cash. Who carries $7 cash? <laughs> Not the Japanese couple that came to go with us. <laughs> And so our first year was 2017. We just started sending boxes of gear to people, not giving them any instructions. Oh, sorry about that. Last year, we started planning the entire trips for them with all these things I just listed. Our numbers jumped up to 350 people. This year, we're at all, today, we're at 215% of where we were at this time last year. This graph shows 191%, so we're expecting close to 800 people. We're gonna shoot for 1,000. Everyone you see in this picture, about half of them, actually, had never been camping before this trip. Every single one of them had never been backpacking. They went from no experience to being able to guide themselves in the wilderness for four days. So the bridge that we're building to get people from the cities and their offices and desks to the wilderness, that bridge is working. And if we were to win this competition, we would try to bring as many people across that bridge as much as possible. It's an awesome service, and I, I truly love sending people out there. It almost makes me want to cry. It's awesome. I, I mean, <laughs> people have told us this has changed our life. We had people that just said, I proposed to my girlfriend just because I was here. You, you went through the numbers quickly. What is the yeah. cost? What is the cost? It, to you for everything in that box? Uh, it costs about, uh, it, each box is different, but our average crate is for two people. So it costs us about two thirds of the, the total price of the trip. And how many bucks. times can that be? Because 
they use it, box it back up, and send it yeah. back to you. What's your experience on user rates? For the boxes themselves, we recycle every box after no, it's used. No, the stuff inside. Oh, the it. stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I'm like, you really like those boxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about, about 15 uses. 15 yeah, uses. Yeah, so that profit margin accounts for that. It does. Yes, and so what we do, we buy everything at wholesale, obviously, and we use it to the point where we can still sell it for what we bought it for at wholesale. So the initial investment of all our gear, we can just recycle it. And then every person we sell gear to, we just obviously say, hey, we're Camp Crate. Go on a trip with us. <laughs> Bring your backpack. Uh, excellent presentation. It's, a, it's, it's very well done. You have a lot of expensive uh, product handouts, gear. How much paid in capital do you have in this company? How much money have you raised? Uh, none. We've bootstrapped it from day one. Um, we just paid for it as we went. So what do you estimate out? You put $1,000 in? How much have we put in? Uh, with all the gear, about 90 backpacking kits, uh, probably about $45,000 worth of gear. And so how many of the total gears do you think you can uh, assemble to generate revenue? Uh, with what we have? Yes. 90, 90 right now. We can send 90 people on trips at the same time. And most of the summer, all 90 kits were out. We didn't have any extra. Have you aligned any strategic partnerships like REI or any of the Yeah, gear? actually, um, I'm going to plug this. That's Chad, by the way. I host a podcast on the side, and I advertise our companies that we use, and they give us better rates because of that. And so I use them to basically knock down a couple percentage points off the wholesale and uh, give them feedback is more incentive to get a better deal. Can you give me a sense of demographic breakout kind of? Yes. So uh, mostly it's uh, millennial couples and millennial families. Uh, millennials are to the point where they're starting to have kids. <laughs> they're, they're finally taking the step. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're wanting to do unique things like they did before. And they don't want to just go to Disney World and be funneled through all the lines. They want to do something unique. So we've had plenty of families tell us we were going to choose Disney or you guys. We went, you guys, we're so glad we did, and we saved, you know, 60% of what we were going to spend. Do you have any data on uh, people that have used it, that have reused it within a year? Yes, yeah, so we've had about a, probably less than five people that have done it twice in one year. Okay. Um, but last year was pretty much our only, you know, source of data for testing that. <laughs> but we have a lot of people booked again this year who did it last year, about a dozen. Um, curious because you're using QR codes. Do you have like an app that you have planned that you want to be able to yes, use in the yes. future? Yes, we're releasing soon. My partner's working on an audio guide tour that alerts you. It's it's all offline. What it does when you're on the trail, it alerts you if there's something interesting to know about a tree or a rock formation. And we're building that out. Um, but we we teach them in the online course how to download all that offline, so they don't need to use data to use the, the map on their phone. But then they have a paper map as well. How many different locations? Eight. Last year, we only had one. So all those 350 people went to one location. It was in California. And if you know anything about California, it was on fire, yeah. like, <laughs> all summer. Yeah. So, we, so we ended up losing 50 customers. Well, I mean, they didn't die out there. <laughs> <laughs> they just canceled their trip. <laughs> but we, we were able, that forced us to build four itineraries in the Mammoth Lakes area, uh, Lake Tahoe, and then Big Sur, if you're familiar with that area. So we have two there and one in Lake Tahoe. And how are you marketing for the main part? Social right? media, my podcast. It's a big podcast. Please subscribe. Um, <laughs> it's my only source of revenue or income right now. <laughs> and uh, social media, of course. And we, we advertise to people who want to already go to these locations. They don't know they want to go backpacking. They just want to go to the Grand Canyon. Then they see our ad and say, let's do this instead. We'll save money and we'll have more memories from this. So that's who we market to. Do you have, I'm sorry, do you have time? Do you have plans to do anything other than just hiking, like other types of adventure? Uh, that's my expertise. Um, maybe if I develop that a little further. I like to do bike tours, maybe bike, biking one day. Yeah, that's how I gained all this knowledge. I biked through all the national parks and wrote about it. All right. Hey, judges, I need to tell you, 
that all of the competitors had a big rule, and it was not to give you anything physically in your hands. Oh, really? <laughs> I thought we were giving a printout. The last one breaks the rule. Ah. You were last. Here, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so listen, the public voting is open for one more minute. What? what? We've been here for two hours. <laughs> Who needs a reminder of how to do the public voting? Oh. Tankevent.com. Tankevent.com. Go there, choose the Regis Innovation Center, Innovation Challenge. Pretend you have one million dollars. One million dollars. Pick the percentage of that million dollars you'd like to distribute to the teams. We'll give you the warning. Judges, you good? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, while we're doing some good public math here, we mentioned that one of our alums, Kenton, Kenton Lee, had a prize to give out. Access to his incubator, the Pursuit Incubator, and a $1,000 prize. It's his choice. Kenton? Thank you so much. I'm proud to be a Regis alum tonight. This was amazing. I'm so excited. And uh, if, you, if you missed my speech, that's OK. But uh, long story short, uh, 10 years ago, I had an idea for a shoe that could grow. It took six years to work on it. Um, but we finally made it, and then we went viral, and now we've got over 250,000 pairs of the shoe that grows in over 100 countries. And, but I saw how difficult it was to have an idea and turn it into a reality. And so now our organization, we just started in January, offering the chance for entrepreneurs around the world who have an idea for a product. We're not great at services and maybe some other things, but... We've really gotten pretty good at making a product and getting it out there. And so our Pursuit Incubator is trying to find entrepreneurs who want to make products that can help fight poverty. We're working with five entrepreneurs already uh, from around the world. And Dr. Ken was so gracious to um, allow me the opportunity to see what was pitched tonight and see if there were any products uh, that are f trying to fight poverty in some ways and to see if our Pursuit Incubator uh, could bring them some value so that these ideas can happen and can get out there and make a difference. So we have a $1,000, uh, no strings attached, prize tonight, uh, and also entry into the Pursuit Incubator uh, if we could bring some value. Um, we're still getting started. It's a little rough, so as a preface to whoever wins. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm so excited. I saw one, well, I saw nine amazing business ideas tonight. Some of you aren't with don't have products, and that's OK. Um, but there was one uh, clear one in my mind, a great product that looks like it has the potential to really fight poverty around the world. And so tonight, I am choosing in-stream water. Congratulations. Yeah. I don't have a, I don't have a giant check. It's, it's, a, it's just a normal-sized check. I, I already gave it to. There's literally nothing to give you guys but a handshake. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Come up, take pictures. Oh, I don't even have a camera, Dr. Ken. We got uh, lots of We got a camera. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll be more prepared next year. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thanks so much. Congrats, Instri. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we have a couple uh, special announcements. Where's, where's Mason? I know I pushed him off the stage. Come get your recyclable box. <laughs> and, and all the other stuff. <laughs> uh, we have a couple special announcements. Uh, Dr. Tim Keene, Dean of the Anderson College, I'd like to call you up. Thanks, Ken. And I'll, I'll just say, four years ago when we launched the business school, the idea was that we were going to try to make it the most innovative business school in the country. And when we approached Ken, the idea was that Ken was going to make it the most innovative business school in the country. And I've got to say, you know, he thanks everyone, 
because there's been a lot of supporters here, but I just want to take a second to say, without Ken Sagendorf, really this business school would probably not exist. So, Ken, we want to say thank you to you. So, awesome job. There you go, man. Now, I'm just going to ask Jamie Granowski to just say a word now that you've been, a, you're our angel uh, for this, and maybe you could just say a word or two. That would be great. Thanks, buddy. You, uh, hey, Kenny, he gets paid to say you did a great job, but I, I don't. Uh, so while you're over there trying to tabulate all the results, uh, seriously, when, when the, 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 this little seed germinated in a Petri dish some 50 months ago, uh, I never would have thought that we would come to this point in time. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations to all of you that presented uh, unbelievable how this has uh, matured and become more sophisticated. Um, you get it. And there is so much capital out there. I know I mentioned this last year, but only one or two of you are going to make some money tonight. But don't let that be a deterrent to what is possible. A couple of the judges, including myself, we have access to private equity, to VCs, um, and I will only speak for myself. Feel free to give me a call after this is over. I've talked to several of you before and during the course of the year. Um, I can't make promises, but what I can do is I'm a good listener, and I think I can help you um, maybe open up some avenues that you currently do not have access to. So congratulations to each and every one of you. And, you know, I'm humbled. Uh, the Gronowski Innovation Center is a culmination of 45 years in the food business, and our family was blessed in a lot of ways. But the last piece missing in terms of, as I looked at it, was closing the loop, and that loop is to provide young people the smartest generation truly the smartest generation. Half of the stuff that was just such a flyover for me, I mean, God bless you, but I, I don't understand technology. Um, thank God my wife does. If she goes before me, I'm toast. Uh, <laughs> but the last piece and why we were so committed to Regis University and building and putting together the Innovation Center was to close that last piece of the loop and, yeah, and allow young, bright minds to bring forth ideas like you're seeing tonight. And I got to tell you, it, uh, my mother and father, God rest their souls, they would be so proud of all of you that have participated. And I'm so proud because it really feels like the investment we made um, is providing exactly what we expect it to. So congratulations to each and every one of you. And Kenny, once again, um, none of this is possible without you. So you don't need to get on your knees anymore and asking for me. <laughs> the, the church is only on Saturday night or Sunday. Anyway, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Let me make one quick announcement. All right. In my hand, I have the winners of tonight's competition. <laughs> T-shirt. All right. Before I announce the winners, because I have a captive audience, and because what I'm about to say is very important. Remember earlier when we were doing introductions, we, we, we stood up a group of young, of young people from Arupe Jesuit High School, that we have reached back from the Anderson College of Business, and we have started an innovation club at Arupe Jesuit High School. Awesome. So entrepreneurship is about that life cycle. And if you can start people and you can, and you can envelop them with community and support earlier and longer, they're more likely to succeed. And that's what we're doing when we reach back to Arupe Jesuit High School with that. If you remember the slides earlier, I tried very hard to put a subliminal message in there because 
once you come out of a place like Arupe Jesuit High School and that innovation club, and you come into the Anderson College of Business at Regis, where you have opportunities like, where's my home fix? Like entrepreneurial innovation class, or like the nine teams that are doing the innovation challenge. That's the second step in the journey. But more is needed to make sure that businesses are successful. And if you can surround people for up to three years, we know that a business is more likely to be sustainable after you let go of it. So what we've done with partners, and John, can I get you to come up here? Where's Tim Keene? So what we've done with good partners is we've tried to figure out how to extend this life cycle from those high school kids coming in to those kids and students and, and adults that have all of this opportunity while they're here with us in the Anderson College of Business. And I, I need to tell the full story. Uh, is Ruben hanging around over there somewhere? Ruben Martinez is up there. Ruben and Ruben Martinez, everybody. When, when, you get, when you get home, please, when you get home, Google Ruben Martinez um, and see what company he started. Okay? Glamping Hub. Awesome, right? Ruben is an alum, a double alum of Regis. And he and I, we teach together entrepreneurial innovation. And it's awesome. Um, <laughs> yes, it is awesome. Um, and Ruben works downtown in a space that this gentleman owns. And so Ruben came to me and he said one night before class, hey, Ken, can we talk? And I was like, OK. Um, I thought he wanted to talk about what we were going to do in class that night. But he wasn't. He said, Ken, would you like, if there was a space specifically for Regis University students and alumni to go into an accelerator afterwards and support them for up to 30 months, would you be interested in that? What would you say? <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah, that's exactly what we'd say, right? And so Ruben introduced me to John, and John uh, is a man of faith, and he said, you know, I understand what you're trying to do in this, in this Jesuit education of yours. I understand what this stewardship concept is and what you're trying to do. And he said, I'd really like to be your partner. And, and, and we partnered, and we just got the MOU signed on an accelerator that will be the next step after you come out of things like the Innovation Challenge. So John Vasquez, thank you. Stay here for one minute. And so I want to I drop the name on you for what that accelerator is going to be called. And in this space of, of innovation and entrepreneurship, the words uh, incubator and accelerator, sometimes they get mixed up. But the accelerator really is meant to whip you out there with more velocity after your idea is validated and incubated in a place in a competition like this. In the Jesuit world, we have a construct called Magis. And if you're a student here, you should all be nodding your head because it's going to make sense now. So Magis is this concept of doing the more, the better, the greater. And what John and the Anderson College of Business, Zavaro Holdings, and the Anderson College of Business and the Innovation Center are doing is we're creating the Magis Factory Accelerator. So John, I look forward. Thank you. I Lots of good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I have to tell you, we've done the Innovation Challenge for two years. Last year, we announced that day that we got a $10 million gift. This year, we're creating the Magis Accelerator. Wait till next year. All right. So, Zach Bailey, come on up. We're going to call to the stage in no particular order. My home fix. The Invictus Project. And Camp Crate. All right, last year we really booted this because there's no good way to announce who wins each of the prizes. 
somebody always gets the short end of the stick on this one, and I tried to circumvent it last year, and I failed miserably. So I'm just going to give it to you straight in three, two, one. Okay? I learned my lesson. So with a third prize of $1,000, space in the Innovation Center over the summer, the Invictus Project. All right, second prize winner, taking home $5,000 and space in the Innovation Center for the summer, My Home Fix. All right, ladies and gentlemen, your Innovation Challenge winner, $10,000, Space in the Innovation Center, Camp Crate. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming and supporting our entrepreneurs. Um, we appreciate you. Do me a favor and help our event services. Take your trash, national park rules apply. <laughs> Whatever you brought in, bring out. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, judges. These guys will want some. Oh, yeah, and on your way out, if you're interested in supporting the Innovation Challenge, Look for givingday.regis.edu.